Well, we are celebrating our student ministries today. So in light of that, why don't you take a seat and take a look at the screens? idea as he went to the cross before God said let there be light he said let them be mine and this was put in place before anything else in all of creation happened Well, what you all just got to see was a little bit of what the three of us have gotten to experience over the last few weeks at our middle school and our high school summer camps. Um, we had the best week ever and I love camp so much. So that is just a tiny bit of it. But if we haven't gotten a chance to meet yet, my name is Mariah. I am one of the middle school pastors around here. Um, and I have been on, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and I have been on staff with Bayside for the last uh, three and a half years serving in this role. But a little bit of my backstory is that I grew up in a really small town. Um, I grew up in Carson City, Nevada. And through a series of really fortunate events, I ended up in Thrive College in 2014 and 2015. I actually did Thrive College with Zach when we were 18. Um, and then through that time, I ended up back on staff at Bayside. So that's a little bit about my story and how I got here. And we're so excited to share with you guys today. But I'm going to let these two introduce themselves to you. That's right. My name is Zach Proven. I get to work mainly with our high school students over here. Let's go. Get to oversee student ministries as a whole, uh, which includes our young adult ministries coming soon. Uh, I got started here back in 2014 when we launched this campus, did Thrive uh, School uh, and intern with high school. It was an amazing time there. Went away for a few years and been back on staff since 2019 here doing various jobs. Let's go. My name is Dominic Pree, and I get to work with our high schoolers and middle schoolers over there. Come on, shout out, shout out. Uh, I've been on staff here for almost four years now. Uh, for the last year, I've been with the middle school and high schoolers. Before that, I was hanging out with the fourth and fifth graders. And five years ago, I actually interned here with Thrive College as well. I'm an intern for our middle schoolers. And fun fact, during that time, uh, I actually was not planning on being a youth pastor or working in the church of any kind. But through the grace of God um, and through experiencing it, I'm so glad that I'm here and doing what I do. Um, so today, we're jumping back into our series through the book of Acts called Unstoppable. If you haven't been here in a while or this is your first time here, go into the book of the Acts, which is right after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, talking about the story of Jesus. And at the end of Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is with his disciples before he ascends into heaven. And what he tells them to do is to go and make disciples, commanding them to go preach the gospel of all nations to the ends of the earth. And so that's exactly what they do in the early church. They start churches. They tell people about the gospel. And from there, the, the name of Jesus Christ is out there and is being uh, preached to everybody. And in this book of Acts, there is trials, there's death, there's persecution, there's imprisonment. Uh, and the, but the thing is about this is that the Holy Spirit is moving even through all of this. And the reason we call this unstoppable is because even though all this is happening, the Holy Spirit is moving in every single person that is going through and preaching the gospel. Earlier in the chapter, uh, God used the scattering of the disciples to go to different places, uh, even though they were forced to leave because of persecution. And today we see who Philip, who we learned about last week, uh, obey the Spirit of God and how powerful uh, the Spirit is in our obedience. So Zach is going to kick us off into point number one and jump us into Acts 8 today. That's right. If you have your Bibles with me, you could flip to Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. That's where we're going to be at today. I'll give you a second to get there, and we'll get going with that. All right. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road. 
the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, Please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or somebody else? Then Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and a eunuch sa- the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let's pray together this morning. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for being able to gather us together in this church. God, I pray that whatever it is you desire to us to get out of this message, that you would speak it to us clearly. Speak through all of us and bless this morning we have together. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. When we see in the beginning of this passage, it all starts with a call. Philip originally is called to this place called Samaria, where he goes out and he's preaching through all these different villages. He encounters this man named Simon the Sorcerer that's at the beginning of Acts chapter eight, goes from that location, heads off to Jerusalem, and then we find him in this place where he receives this new call, this new direction from the Lord. Again, in verse 26, it says this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now notice the clarification on this road as well. This isn't the decent road. This isn't even the road. This is the desert road. It's like saying, Zach, I want you to go from Sacramento to Los Angeles, only you're not taking Highway 1 with the beach and the trees and the hills. You're taking I-5, and you are going that route, and the only tropical paradise you're gonna see for 100 miles is a little place called Kettleman City, which is a traveler's absolute heaven. But to put it into context as well, that this wasn't just a short journey that he took, but this was upwards of a 100 mile journey that he took by foot going from Samaria to Jerusalem to Gaza, simply out of obedience to the Lord. It picks back up and it says this. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, what we know from this time period is that some of the important officials during this time would be castrated and made into eunuchs so that they would be unable to overthrow the people in power and implement their own family lines into a position of power. Now, when you hear that, that is definitely a painful yet thing that was necessary for them to do to be able to show their allegiance to the people that they worked for. And for us today, there are definitely alternative ways we can show our loyalty to the company that we work for. And so if that has been brought up to you at your workplace, please connect with HR, get legal help, call 877-CASH-NOW, whatever you got to do to be able to get out of that situation. But then we see Philip notices the Ethiopian eunuch. He noticed him, he goes up to him out of this prompting that God put on his heart to do. But why? Why did he even find himself in this journey in this first place? Why was he going down this desert road with no plan, no purpose in mind, just the Lord saying, go? And why did he feel like he was supposed to talk to this man that he probably had nothing in common with? Well, we see from this passage, even this idea that uh, their mode of transportation was so different. Philip most likely walking and this man going by chariot. 
the only thing that we see that they really have in common at this point is this idea that they were in the same place at the same time, and that's about it. But there's a simple truth that we see from this passage here that we can learn today, and it's this, that when we are obedient to the Spirit of God, we follow his call wherever and whenever. So what's God's call for your life? What is that call that he's put on your life that you are supposed to go out and do? I wish I can just tell you this morning, hey, just do this thing and this thing and this thing, and then you're locked in, you're great. And it's in generic sense, you can kind of say that, but it's hard to look specifically for each individual. But when we look throughout scripture, we can see the markers of a life that is on the path that God has called them to. Back in 2014, uh, in this very building, if you picture this whole building, but literally just an empty warehouse, we got to gather together in the beginning of 2014 to start off the new year, and we got to get a bunch of people together to be able to write prayers all over the walls of this building. And I had this prayer that I wrote here. And essentially what my prayer was, was God, would you be able to send people to transform the lives of students and adults in this community to be transformed the same way that I was? Now my specific role for this was kind of unsure because I was just a senior in high school, literally been a Christian for six months, but I just desired and I earned that the same way that I was cared for, that I was reached in my time in high school, would you send somebody else to do the same thing? A few months goes by and I'm off at school, um, get a degree in biology, get into medical school, ready to go, all excited for that. And all of a sudden my wife and I felt like this path is now shut. And we couldn't explain it other than just this lack of peace we had about this. And the only really road that we had uh, that we felt like God was calling to is to come back home. And after a few months of struggle with this, of God, like, did I just make the biggest mistake of my life? Like, did I just ruin my entire, like, future and my family and just holding this weight? And as we're processing through this and wrestling with God, this thing that kept coming back to me, and it was this idea of this, that the same desire, the burden that I had back in 2014 with that prayer, that students would come to know Christ in the greater Rockland, Roseville, Lincoln area, that that same burden actually carried with me to 2019 only it was even more so increased because I had these experiences and different things that I got to couple with it. See, what I had to realize is that I could no longer pray for God to send somebody else to do the work because he gave me this unique burden and said, Zach, you are the one that will do the work. So what's the call in your life? What's that burden in your heart that maybe God's put there, that maybe you keep praying away, you keep praying for somebody else to answer the call, but it keeps coming back to you time and time again, that maybe, just maybe, that calling you feel in your life isn't actually for somebody else to answer, but that is for you to accomplish here on this earth, and that is what Christ desires to do through you. When we look at Philip in this story, we can see that the calling is clear. Whenever, wherever God desired to take him, he'd be ready to minister for the gospel. Now, sometimes we can look at this and think, okay, so do I need to just start walking down I-5 in order to preach the gospel? Not necessarily. But what I would encourage you to do is maybe start looking in your immediate surroundings. Who has God put in your life that maybe you've seen as a distraction, but is the very people that God has called you to reach? Is it just a coincidence that your kids are on the sports teams that they are, or they go to the school, or you're at your workplace? Or maybe, maybe, does God actually have a greater purpose for all of that. And what could that look like? Well, the call could simply be this, the call to be able to start a team dinner for your kids' sports teams instead of praying that somebody else would so you can connect the local families and so it's not just dragging your kids to practice, but there's actually real tangible relationships being built in the midst of it. Or it could look like even just walking around your neighborhood. Would you be the one that gets to know everybody else rather than praying that somebody else would come up to your doorstep to be able to get to know you first? What would it look like if you lived in such a way that you were called to engage with all the people around you for the gospel in your workplace, your school, your sports, wherever you find yourself, rather than just seeing those people that God's put around you as a distraction or pushing it off to somebody else's calling to say that maybe they'll t t teach them about Jesus, but I, I don't know if I'm called to do that. Here's the thing that we need to realize. As you look around in this room here today, that each and every single one of us in this room is the product of somebody at some point sharing the gospel with us and accepting that call in their life. The question is, will you be willing to do the same thing for the people in yours? And if you're wondering, what does that look like? What could that tangibly look like to live a life that models this? There's a student named Jacob Awad who went to high school camp with us this last year. 
And on the last day of camp, he accepts Christ as his Lord and Savior along with 10 other boys in his group. It was this absolutely amazing moment. And then uh, just a 15 minutes later into being a Christian, he finds himself, he's at the dance party that we have to be able to end off the week and he's there and he feels this burning desire with him and with him from the Holy Spirit and saying, you need to go back up to camp. And the crazy thing is, is that I actually had this exact same desire put on my heart as well, except it wasn't from the Holy Spirit. It was this idea that I just had the worst dance moves and I would not be caught within 100 yards of a dance party at any time. But he actually was led by the Holy Spirit in this moment. He goes back up to camp and says, God, what do you wish to do with me? And in this moment, he sees a student sitting by himself. He says, I'm gonna go talk to him. Walks up to him, never met him before, been a Christian for 15 minutes, goes up to him and says, my name is Jacob, do you know Jesus? And he asked him, he says, no, I don't. He says, would you like to accept him as your Lord and Savior right now? And he said, yeah, I'd actually like to do that. This guy who's been a Christian for 15 minutes leads a student to Christ, is filled with the wisdom from the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to answer his questions. We didn't even believe him. He came up to us after and we're just rejoicing about his salvation and he's like, I just led that guy to Christ. We're like, no, what are you talking about? We had to go check with the guy and said, do you know what you just did? And he's like, I just became a Christian. Like, do you even know the name of the guy? He's like, no, I don't, but I just felt like I was supposed to do it. And it's crazy because we look at stories like this and we are just like marveling and like it doesn't make sense, but that's the very point of this passage, that it doesn't have to make sense. It's the power of when we are obedient to the Spirit of God that we follow where he has called us wherever and whenever it takes us. Would you be willing to do the same for the people in your life? Mariah is gonna look at the next point as we continue in the passage. Zach just took um, some time to talk about what happens when we are obedient to the call of Christ. See, with this passage, we see Philip continue the pattern of obedience, not just in his first call, but in the way that he interacts with the Ethiopian in the next few verses. I'm gonna pick up in verse 29, and it says this. It says that when Philip ran up to the chariot, he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken on this earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And then Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Christ. Imagine for a moment the scene in which we are encountering. This man, this Ethiopian has been on a journey for about three months. See, there's no planes, there's no trains, and there's no automobiles. What there is, is chariots and your feet. So when the eunuch went on this journey, it took three months for him to get to Jerusalem. While Philip's on his journey of answering God's call, this man has already began his own journey of faith. See, he's sitting in this uh, chariot and he's reading scripture. Likely this isn't the first time that he's opened his Bible and read this passage. And he's probably reading aloud as was customary in that time. And I I start to think to myself when I read this, how many times have you and me sat and opened our Bibles and just read and asked God, what's going on? Like, help me to understand what this is. See, and as this man sits in his chariot and he reads it, a stranger comes running up to his chariot and says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And he doesn't ask it in a demeaning way. He doesn't say, look how much more knowledge I have. I know everything about God. What Philip does is he genuinely asks the question of, hey, do you understand it? And what the Ethiopian does is he allows space for Philip to come into his chariot and sit alongside of him. To physically share the space of faith. To answer the questions that he has. See, Philip is obedient to the spirit because he is encountering others that Christ is drawing near. It wasn't enough for the man to just desire salvation, but what what Philip helped him do was understand it. See, See, faith isn't a solo sport. I don't know about the rest of you, but I have been locked into the Olympics. 
Like it is playing in the back of our office. I don't know what I'm gonna do after the closing ceremonies. But one of my favorite Olympic sports is wrestling. I grew up in a family with a dad as a wrestling coach and a brother who wrestled and that was my entire childhood. And I was watching uh, wrestling this week and there was a girl who won a gold medal. Her name is Sarah Hildebrandt. And as I was watching her interview after she won this gold, they asked her, they said, hey, what, like, who do you wanna thank? How'd you do this? And she said, I need to thank my coaches, my training partners, my family, and my team. See, the thing about wrestling is when you get onto the mat, it's you and one other person, but you don't become an Olympic gold medalist by training on your own. You don't become an Olympic gold medalist by just hoping that, it would, that you would be good. You become an Olympic gold medalist by spending time training with another person by going through hard things together, by getting better, by someone pointing out things that you could be better at. In our own walk with faith, this story paints the picture perfectly that faith isn't a solo sport for us, that we become closer to God when we understand who he is, when we are in small groups and in community, when we come to church, when we encounter other Christians, that we are strengthened by this faith. Because when God is drawing people near to him, we will see the spirit move. See, Philip was empowered to share that day when he ran up alongside the chariot. And we need to understand what the Ethiopian was reading. He was reading from a passage of scripture in Isaiah, and it is actually describing the suffering servant. And what that is, is it's a prophecy of what Christ would come and do on this earth. What it is saying is that there is a perfect, blameless lamb of God that would be sent, that would be 100% fully man and fully God, and that he would walk the earth just like we do, but he would answer prophecy, he would raise people from the dead, he would do miracles, and then he would get on a cross, and that he would die. The most painful death that we could imagine that in that moment when he got on the cross, he would take on every bit of brokenness and sin, all of the hurt that has been done to you and the hurt that has been done by you. That when he got on the cross, he would break the bonds of addiction, that he would break the bonds of guilt and shame, that he would take generational trauma and he would break it. That God, when he got on that cross, what Jesus did is he said that Christians don't have to live in death but that we can be made new. I have to believe that when they got in that chariot, that Philip looked the Ethiopian in the eyes and said, this is the story that Christ has for you today. And here's the thing is that I think that that story that Philip told about Christ on the cross to the Ethiopian man, God is telling to you and me that this is a promise that God has for you, that God has for me, that there is nothing that is too far from the grace of Jesus, that there's no brokenness that is too broken for him. And that when he sat in that chariot, that Philip met the Ethiopian where he was. He didn't try to drag him to the perfect scripture or the perfect verse. In fact, I would challenge you that the Old Testament in every fiber and every verse, there is an opportunity to preach the good news of Christ. And so my question for you today is this, is that what doors are God opening for you? I've worked in camping ministry and in student ministries for a long time. And while these two are playing spike ball and basketball or whatever they're doing at camp, I'm not near those things. Um, I am in fact at the craft table. I'm deeply passionate about the spiritualness of a friendship bracelet. Let me explain it to you. So I love friendship bracelets. And part of the reason I love friendship bracelets is that they take time. And so actually when you're tired at camp, the best place to be is to sit down with a group and to teach them how to make a friendship bracelet. And this is a picture that someone took at camp. It literally is just like a candid photo. This is where I was all of camp, was making friendship bracelets. But the thing is, is that the conversations that come at a friendship bracelet table are better than anywhere else, I think. It's where students start to kind of process and think, hey, what was that thing I heard in the sermon? They might tell you about their family, something they've been wanting to share, but they didn't know how. They might ask a question about something that someone said to them about the gospel. And as you put each bead onto a friendship bracelet, 
Sometimes the biggest questions come from those small moments. And as I read this passage, I just have the question that goes in my mind of what doors is God opening? How do we not miss these moments where people are reaching out for Christ? How do we be obedient to the spirit with the people that he is drawing near? As Philip was running to the chariot, I get that picture in my mind, that as God called him, he started to run. Um, I don't run. I don't like to run. It, I can walk, it's fine. So here's the thing is that when I read this passage about Philip running, unless something is chasing me or I am in imminent danger, I'm not moving quickly. And so when Philip is running, I actually challenges me to say, when is the last time that I was that deeply passionate that someone in my life encountered Christ? When is the last time that I saw or heard God move and said, I need to run to tell them about how good of a God there is? What would it look like for you and me as Christians in this room that if we saw an opportunity, no matter how small or how big, that we ran and were desperate to ask people if they understood Christ? See, often we get so caught up in what we have to do for God but the gospel begins and ends on the very simple idea of what God has already done for us in Christ. And so when we are obedient to what the spirit is doing, we will encounter those he is drawing near. Now Dominic's gonna come up and tell you a little bit about what happens next. When we are obedient to the spirit, we follow God's call, we we encounter others that God is drawing near, and we experience God's transformation. Also, I just wanna stop and pause again and shout out the middle schoolers and high schoolers over there. If you guys could give it up for them real quick, shout them out, come on. (laughs) Middle schoolers hanging out in service today, let's go. So we jump down to verse 36, and it reads, as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered that the chariot stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized them. As you see here, the Ethiopian just responded to the gospel. He said yes to Jesus. He said yes to following him and believing in him and understood the passage in Isaiah 53. It wasn't anything that Philip did. It wasn't that he was a good salesman. I'm sure he may have been a good door-to-door salesman and sold you some solar this year, but it was the work of the Holy Spirit and not his salesmanship. It was the work of the obedience of being a vessel through Philip and through the, the obedi- or through the Spirit working in this moment of them meeting together. We can also assume that Philip talked to the Ethiopian man about baptism and what it means and taking your next steps in this faith, in this calling and what this means to be a Christian. If you see in your Bible, you may not have a verse 37. You might have it down in your footnotes, Uh, but the reason for that is that some scholars believe that there is not enough evidence or translation in this, but a lot of other scholars with specific translations say that it says this in verse 37. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Even if it wasn't said, we know that his actions represent him following the gospel and him following and be a follower of Jesus. We also know that this this isn't taken out because it isn't biblically inaccurate or wrong, but we know that what he's saying is right due to Romans 10, 9 through 10, where Paul says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. His confession and even his baptism shows that the Ethiopian believed that Jesus was fully God and fully man, that God raised Jesus from the death, that he believed in his mind and in his heart that Jesus was Lord and Savior over his life that he understands the doctrine of salvation and what it means to follow Jesus. Philip's transformation was being obedient to the power of the spirit of God and getting out of his own way for his pride, uh, of of getting out of being embarrassed for maybe saying the wrong words or not having the right wisdom and even sticking with everyone else that was in Samaria and Judea. But how would our lives look if we were obedient to the spirit of God? How would our lives be transformed if we followed God's call, 
If we said yes to the people that God is drawing near to us. Well, I know one student in particular that said yes. Uh, a couple, a few months back, a student named Christopher, he's a sophomore in high school, 15 years old, walks into this building. Uh, coincidentally, a girl invited him to church and she wasn't actually here. Might have been a good thing for him. Shows up at church, gets connected, we get connected. He ends up coming uh, quite a few Sundays during the summer, comes to our hangs, uh, meets a group of guys. He gets signed up for summer camp and gets to summer camp. While he's there in his small group, he gets really connected with this one student named Braylon. And something you need to know about Braylon is Braylon, four months back in our Mexico mission trip, got saved as well. And when he got back home, he got baptized. So when he was there, they were having conversations about the Bible. Christopher was asking questions and Braylon was answering it and Braylon shared his testimony. On the last night of camp, the preacher gave a moment to accept Christ in your life. And Christopher, through the spirit of working in his life in the week, working through his leaders and working through Braylon, he accepted Christ that night. And when he got home last week, he got baptized. And here's a picture right up here of Christopher being baptized. Come on. Christopher was changed and transformed by the spirit of God working from his friends, from his leaders, the connections that he made and going to camp. The transformation that happened was in the spirit of God and everybody being used by the hands and feet of Jesus of getting him to this moment. Now I can't explain, I can't explain how, but the power of the Holy Spirit through our obedience trans transforms lives for generation and generations. I am a byproduct of my parents being obedient to the spirit of God, for them saying yes to following Jesus, for raising me up in the church, for raising me up and teaching me scripture and teaching me how to have a relationship with Jesus and walking alongside Jesus in their own personal relationship with him. Through their obedience to the spirit, I, my life was transformed and families and families will be transformed through generations through our obedience in the spirit. Come on. In verse 39, it says, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord took Philip away and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus and he passed through, when he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he reached Caesarea. Now, I don't know about you, I look at the scripture and I think scripture tells us that teleportation is the best superpower to have. Not flying, not super strength, nothing else but teleportation. This seems like a very unnatural, weird kind of event to happen for Philip to be taken away. But if you're like me and you believe in God and you look at Genesis 1, you know that God created the heavens and the earth. And for Philip to be taken away and transported somewhere else is not an unusual thing, but a supernatural thing that God can do. If you don't believe me, there's a couple other instances like that in John chapter six, when the disciples' boat immediately reached the shore and something else like this will happen in First Thessalonians four, when it says, we'll be caught up in the air with them in the clouds talking about the end times. Now what happened with the eunuch? Well, the eunuch came out of the water rejoicing. Now I want you to imagine this for a second. You're here and you're getting baptized on a Sunday morning. You're right over here where the baptismals are, the worship team's going, the, 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 the congregation, we're, we're, we're worshiping, we're celebrating. But as you come up out of the water, the, the two people that are baptizing you on your left and your right, they're not there anymore. The worship team's singing, they're not there anymore. The congregation, not there anymore. The greeters at the front door, they're not there anymore. How would your response be? Would you continue to rejoice? I, I know that the, the eunuch did. And the reason that he did is because he didn't put his faith in Philip. He didn't put his faith in the world. He didn't put his faith in the things that leave us empty. But he put his faith in the one that fills us. He put his faith in the one that gives us life and brings us life. I love the image of baptism because when we go under the water and we come up out of it, it cleanses us. Not the physical water, but the principle of it and the idea that we die with Christ and we're raised with Christ and that he makes us new. That we leave our burdens and our baggage and our bondage behind. 
that we come out new with Christ, that we get to walk in step with him, hip to hip, and he wants to, wa wants to walk alongside of us because he loves us and has compassion for us. No matter what shame, no matter what we've done, no matter hurt we carry or the way we bring to the table, he says it doesn't matter because I just want you. And the spirit that lives inside of us is God himself. Jesus describes it as a helper or a guider. And what's so beautiful about that is, is that we know that we don't walk alone, that we get to walk in step with the one that created us and knows us and sees us and loves us. Now imagine if we lived a life that was filled with rejoicing, if we get to walk out of this room fully believing that our lives are transformed, fully believing that God truly does have a purpose for us, fully believing that he does want to draw you near the people that you may, that you may have in your life that you may not like, that you may gotta tolerate, but God wants to draw you near to them, to maybe create deeper relationship with them or to present the gospel to them so they can be a brother and sister in this family. And what happened to Philip? Well, Philip did the work of the Spirit. Philip went on to continue to be obedient to the Spirit. He didn't stay in the Samaritan cities. He didn't stay where it was comfortable. He went to the Gentile cities, the places where people did not look like him, did not talk like him, or did not act like him. Even with this conversation and this moment that he has, is an uncomfortable, different moment that they would have normally never had. But instead, he went out because Jesus commanded them to. And we see that the book of Acts is an unstoppable church, not because of what you and I bring to the table, not because of how strong we are or our willpower, but because of the Holy Spirit working inside of us. Because of the Holy Spirit working in the apostles and the disciples and the church body. But it is not you and I that can go continue making disciples. It is the Spirit that works through us, and we are only a vessel. We are a vessel for Christ, and I fully believe he wants to use every single one of us for his plan. Church, don't wait for God to do unusual things in our lives. Don't wait for the big miracle to happen. Go out, get your hands dirty, go work. Go and make disciples and let God do the unusual things that we cannot do. Because remember that when we are obedient to the Spirit, we follow God's call wherever, whenever. When we're obedient to the Spirit, He leads us and encounters us to those who are drawing near. And when we are obedient, we experience God's transformation. And if you're in here, and this may be your first time to church, or you've been coming for a while, or you're still discovering this Christianity thing, or who this Jesus guy is, I wanna tell you that personally in my life, he has transformed my life and changed it from the inside out. And we wanna give that opportunity for you. There's an opportunity every day for you, but if you're in here and there's something inside of you stirring that you were compelled to go, I, I want this. I want to be transformed. I, I want a purpose in my life and I don't quite understand it. I, I want to encounter others that God is drawing me near. I want to give you this opportunity right now. So if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer silently. And the rest of you, if we could close our eyes and bow our heads. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I, I thank you that Jesus went to the cross in place of me to take my sin, to bear it on the cross, to take my shame, and to take it on the cross. So God, I repent of my sins, my burdens, my baggage, my bondage. God, I, I leave it all to you and I hand it to you. God, would your Holy Spirit walk with me and transform me from the inside out. I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Hey, church, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be able to come and speak this morning. We are so grateful to you guys here.